and welcome back. I'm Esther Gidu Ewart sitting in for Shaka Sali. Before the break, we were talking about the 48 hours given to the Electoral Commission definitely to announce the winner and uh, Milton was talking about how flawed this Electoral Commission has been. But turning to you here, Rushdie, and we're going to continue on that, on that definitely. Rushdie, turning to you here in the studio, uh, when you look at Uganda, uh, uh, Museveni has been credited with about 28 years of stability. We know the history of Uganda. It was something that you would not want a repeat of in the East African region. But so what next for the stability of the so-called the Pearl of Africa? I think that there's still a lot that could be done. Um, we're seeing a, a, a big backlash from the ground, even though voters went to the polls. I mean, elections are not the be-all and end-all of democracy. Um, just before the break, uh, Milton spoke about the fact that the Election Commission has, has been facing a number of different storms and those storms have not started today. They started several years ago already with their original appointment. Every single one of the, the elections in 2005 and 2011 have been contested in the courts. And most likely what we're going to be seeing is that there will be an, another, another appeal to the courts. What we don't want to be seeing is a situation where the opposition uh, leaders are under house arrest and that uh, the computers of the, the, the um, opposition parties are being uh, um, confiscated by the police, which, which complicates a potential petition which needs to be there. There needs to be due course um, and a respect for those processes to unfold. I mean, today we have local government elections in Uganda. Um, indications are yes. the turnout is very low mm -hmm. and people, are, it's maybe an expression, not just right. the general sense that uh, people don't pitch up for local government elections, but I think more a protest action against the, the, the situation as it currently stands. And I think uh, a revamp or reform of the election commission is something which is very important, which needs to be addressed. It's been on the court for several years in terms of the appointment process, the, the tenure, um, the process by which uh, their, their office can be repealed. Um, so all of those things lay the foundation for the fact that there's a large amount of distrust on the election commission. And where we've seen situations where there is a lot of, dis uh, a lot of trust in the election commissions, people tend to be very forgiving of, of, of things like materials arriving late um, on election day or weaknesses in communications. But within this particular context, because of the lack of trust, which is, is there, arguments that the institution is not independent, that there's a lack of transparency in the decision making, this all complicates matters and lays the foundation for a call for institutional reform, which will almost probably uh, gain more uh, uh, groundswell as the days continue. And uh, Elizabeth, before I get to Milton, because he's burning with uh, comments about what he is hearing from uh, his native country of Uganda, mm -hmm. the use of state machinery. And if you remember, just before the elections, the social media was shut off. Like, people were not able to tweet, they wouldn't go on Facebook. Uh, how, what did that spell anyway from the word go that what did we have to expect about this election? The state said this was for security purposes, national security. Mm -hmm but other people interpret it otherwise. Absolutely, I think we saw a, a lot of repression on the part of the state that, that affected the, the turnout and, and the, the, result, the end numbers in the election. There was significant detention of opposition candidates and opposition supporters in the lead up to the election. There was widespread intimidation of journalists. This is well documented by Ugandan organizations and international organizations. And there are, there's sadly, there's legal basis for this repression in Uganda. There is a law called the Public Order Management Act, which was passed in 2013, which significantly limits freedom of assembly in Uganda. And I really agree with Rushdie's point that democracy is not just in the elections. So we should be concerned, the international community, Ugandans, about the impact that this will have on democracy going forward. There's another law the NGO Act, which has been passed by Parliament but not yet signed in, into law by Museveni, which would really curtail the ability of NGOs to operate independently. So state machinery has been in use in many ways uh, in the lead up to this election and, and there are many instruments of the state that will continue to impede democracy. As for the social media shutdown, I, I think that 
that was somewhat unexpected, maybe not a big surprise, but unexpected. I think what was interesting to note is that Ugandans are, are tech savvy and young and well educated, and many of them managed to bypass this by downloading virtual private networks onto their phones and, and skirting the, the restrictions. Milton, I hear you uh, kind of agreeing with a lot of uh, what is yeah. being said here in the studio. Can you weigh yes. in on some of those, especially the use of state machinery uh, prior to yes. the elections and even now? Okay, well, first of all, I want to also address the whole issue of stability. I think that's a, a widely spread myth, first of all, because at one point in the northern part of the country, virtually the entire population of 1.2 million people were confined in what is literally concentration camps, people in Acholi region, for almost 15 years. If that is the price of stability, that's not really stability at all because it's now been estimated that over the 15-year period, perhaps 800,000 to 1 million people died. Those are the untold stories about this so-called stability. And in an autocratic state, there is always stability. We saw it in Egypt. We saw it in now uh, Chile under Pinochet. We saw it throughout history in Germany under Hitler. Italy under Benito Mussolini. Those were all stable, quote unquote, stable countries. So we should not give General Museveni any license in terms of that. And then let me address the issue of the voting itself. There were instances of pre-ticked ballots. How do we count those as votes? There were instances of actually centers where these ballots are being doctored. And Dr. Bessie himself stormed one of these centers. He went with a lawyer and other witnesses and the police came there, and instead of investigating what was going on in those secret locations, they arrested Dr. Besige instead. So what we have in Uganda today is paralysis. We have somebody who claims he won, he won, but people don't really believe he won. And we have the so-called opposition leader who may actually be the president-elect. I think this is when the UN can do the same thing that was done in Afghanistan. Let's have an audit and determine who really won these elections so that we can have true stability and democracy in Uganda. I hear you, Milton, but I'm also wondering whether at this point do we know when President Museveni expects to be sworn in for the fifth term? I don't think Ugandans are very interested in that, and you raised a very good issue. You said there was no celebration at all because I think the rigging and the abuse of the process was so blatant that even NRM supporters are embarrassed by this. And personally, as a Ugandan, I would also like to apologize to the rest of the world by the conduct of President Museveni, by his behavior. In the last one week, I think his behavior has been quite embarrassing to most Ugandans, regardless of which party they support.